Accrediting Excellence, the international authority for professional coaching and mentoring, proudly presents both sides of the coin. Today is White Ribbon Day. Thousands of people across the UK will stand up, speak out and say no to violence against women. As a coach, I've had clients who have been in abusive relationships, and I've also had a client who has admitted inflicting violence towards his partner as a result of PTSD. As coaches, we have responsibility to work in best practice in this area to ensure we can enable our clients to move forward in a positive way. Today, we'll get some top tips to improve our coaching. Welcome to Both Sides of the Coin, a podcast produced by the IAPC and M. We're a leading accreditation body and our aim is to increase public confidence and to raise industry standards by enforcing a rigorous accreditation process that ensures the quality of professional coaches and mentors. The podcast is aptly named Both Sides of the Coin because we talk to both a coach, mentor or training provider and one of their clients to explore both sides of the coaching mentoring intervention. What works and what doesn't? As the proverb says, iron sharpens iron. Before we get started, let me introduce myself. I'm Jenny Butter, your host and an accredited master coach. I've been coaching for nine years, mainly in the area of career transition and life coaching. Joining me today is Louise Borthwick. Louise is a highly experienced psychological relationship coach, author, thought leader and advocate for relationship health. She works with people who have been or are currently in difficult relationships. Louise herself has been in an abusive relationship, so she's going to give both sides of the coin and she'll talk about her own experience as a coach and a survivor. And she'll also share what some of her clients have fed back to her. Louise, welcome to both sides of the coin. Hi, nice to be here. Good morning. Tell me about yourself. Well, um, I've had uh, a long history of difficult relationships, starting from when I was adopted to... Um, difficult relationships with family and other members of a wider friendships and uh, other people, um, which then went on to uh, having multiple failed relationships, um, including domestic abuse and sexual abuse. So I've experienced quite a lot of, of the topics that my clients bring to the table. I've also cleared everything that contributed to those behaviours and so I kind of understand where my clients are coming from and I know how I can help them best to overcome those difficult issues. At what point in a difficult relationship do you find that your clients think I'm going to seek Louise out and make significant changes for good? Clients get to a place where they just can't handle it anymore quite a lot of the time they've already sought out other uh, therapies including you know CBT and counselling they've already tried and tried because they're kind of aware that something in them's got to change but they're also drawn into a blame game which is promoted by you know we've got to blame we've got to be accountable for our actions so you know uh, the abuser or has to take account you know be accountable for their behavior and and so that really just exaggerates this blame thing and um it takes a lot for a person to get to a place where they think actually it could be something that I'm doing what usually that they get to a place where they want they're, they're thinking why am I attracting this sort of behavior why am I attracting people like this in my life why do people want to um want to treat me like this you know a lot of my clients come to me because I'm their last resort they've tried everything they just want it to stop so how do you help the clients get to the core of the problem it's about looking at the clients uh key characteristics really So I have a really strict uh, introduction session with my clients um, and I probably, you know, go into depth a lot more to build the trust initially, because unless the client's going to trust me and trust that actually I'm going to be respectful to them, I'm going to listen to them, I'm going to understand where they're coming from and I actually want to understand, they're not going to... get the best out of that coaching relationship. And the biggest 
characteristic that a client comes to the table is that they really lack in trust. So to build that trust, you know, I use the rapport building kind of methods, if you like. So, you know, initially I have a really stringent coach contract because a lot of clients, as much as they want to engage, they <clears throat> find it very difficult to do something consistently or commit to anything because they don't trust it. And so I, I have developed a really good coach contract that I go through in detail with my clients. I go through the confidentiality, the safeguarding. And not only that, I have a, a coach agreement. So before we even go into any coaching, what I tend to do is I ask my clients, what's your expectations of me? You know, because expectations is another big key characteristic where everybody's got to, you know, that people with these key characteristics have have this um, unrealistic expectation sometimes. And so it's good to get that groundwork done. We write it down, we sign it, you know. What is it you expect from me and what do I expect from you? It's a, it's a, an agreement. It's, it's kind of binding because later on down the road, I can come back to that and say, well, this is what we agreed. The other thing I do is in my introduction, in my kind of building this trust and rapport is I ask people about their goals, their ultimate, their, their you know, when they first come to me, What's the goal and what's the obstacles you foresee right now? And we go through that because unless they've got a goal in mind, and that might be, oh, I just don't want this to happen anymore. I don't want to feel like this. I, you know, I can come back to that with them and say, look, this is what we were trying to achieve here. So because a lot of the time, survivors of, of domestic abuse and violence have a tendency to want to avoid or minimize they want to justify everything over explain they're deeply emotionally connected to this issue right and they react bad react kind of quickly and so everything's an extreme so it's really good to have those goals and obstacles to come back to so that we can ground everything again. A couple of other things that I do is I explain about this car park. Another key characteristic is that survivors want to story tell. They, they, they want to story tell and they tend to, and I used to do this as well as a client. I'd go round every mountain, cross every river and up and down dale um, before I even got to the point. Uh, but in that discussion, there's usually quite a lot of information that can be used either later on. So it's about car parking, that bit, those tiny bits of information to come back to. So I explain that because I want my clients to know that I'm really listening to everything they're saying. And finally, I always give my clients a signal. So if they are over explaining or storytelling or getting into a bit of an emotional position um, that they have a signal to to stop that you know they don't have to continue to, to talk to me on that subject they can just put their hand up or we agree a signal so that you know they know they've got to get out because a lot of the time um, clients they come to the table and they want to please. They, they kind of almost want to do it for you at first because that's the nature of their key characteristics is their carers, their nurturers, their, they, they, you know, they want to do please others. And so that is kind of where I go at the beginning of a relationship. And I find that really interesting what you said about getting bogged down in the story. As coaches, it's really important that we almost remove ourselves from the story and focus on what the client's feeling. For sure, definitely. And, you know, <clears throat> I don't know if you've been a client, but I've been a client and I have been 
completely guilty of storytelling to the point of I don't even know what the point was I was trying to get to you know you, people get lost so it's a really good idea to have that in the back of your mind that this is a key characteristic a common trait of anybody who's experienced any traumatic um experience uh that they they want to story tell they want to go into the finer detail because actually they don't understand it themselves and they're trying so hard to justify it and one of the issues that comes up is that no matter how much you explain a situation to somebody they're never going to understand it from your perspective and so it's about helping those clients to just pinpoint those really key problems that they actually can and have the tools already to overcome. It sounds like that's a common theme that comes up when working with clients who've experienced domestic abuse or coercive control. What other common themes are there? Um, a lot of the common themes is that they have a lot of self-doubt um, you know their self-worth is on the floor it's really important to realize that sometimes strong questions can provoke a really emotional response and we might not be ready for that as the coach you know so there's a lot of really deep-rooted self-worth self-confidence issues going on and they're all emotionally overwhelming um and and that is a common theme that comes up is this emotional overwhelm and I do a lot of work with clients um, on emotional processing and how to actually connect to emotions and and process them in the moment but you know first of all many many survivors have really got to a point where they're not even connected to their emotions they can't they can't even identify how they feel because there's so many emotions going on um it's so overwhelming that to identify just one emotion is is really really difficult so that's what we break it down to we break it down and identify what these emotions are and um what these emotions look like to us um that's one thing um and i want to come back to you know in society right now um to deal with domestic abuse we tend to get into a blame game situation because uh abusers you know we feel as a society have to take responsibility for their behavior and so what we've got to remember with with survivors of abuse is that they're in that blame game and so it's helping them to to separate themselves from that blame game and actually focus on you know what they can take out of this situation the strengths the you know how they've got over such adverse situations and what they can do to use those uh, tools that they've actually already been developing whilst they've been in you know as coping mechanisms that they've developed whilst they've been in that situation, right? Um, because a lot of the time they don't see themselves as part of the problem. But when we're in a relationship, whether it's a domestic abusive relationship or not, we are actually relating, might not be very well, but we are relating with somebody else, which means that we're part of that relationship. Whether whoever's fault it is, and a lot of the time, um, the blame game promotes this power seesaw. And to give you an example of that, you know, if you've got um, an abuser who's, you know, angry and throwing his weight around and trying to control something or being violent, when that bully, we're talking, you know, we can talk about bullying, it's the same thing. When that person who's trying to gain control or power over somebody else, when somebody stands up to that person, that person most of the time will sit and cry. You know, these, these abusers sit and cry. And so that makes the survivor the powerful person in that relationship. It's still a relationship. So that creates this power seesaw, right? And it's not about who's to blame. It's about what is causing 
these deep rooted issues. You've shared the most amazing coaching techniques and, and models and questions for us to ask. What case study have you got of a client that you've worked with that you can show those where they were when they started with you and what happened at the end of your coaching relationship? Well, I will share um, a, a client with you. And um, uh, this is uh, a client that I worked with quite a long time ago, actually. But this client, you know, was a uh, victim of very traumatic sexual assault, rape, and her perpetrator or the abuser uh, did a five year prison sentence. Um, and she came presented to me as somebody who couldn't look up from the floor. She told me, why would I have friends? Uh, why would anyone like me? You know, her self-worth, as I said, you know, those, those key characteristics of somebody who's been in that situation, the, the way that people turn it in on themselves, you know, why would anyone like me? I'm worth nothing. That's where she was. She was on the floor. And one of the techniques I used was to try and ha help her to connect with me as a person. So I asked her if we actually at the time it was there was a red mat on the on the table and I asked her would you mind if we put your experience onto this red mat so that I can get to know you because at the moment I'm talking to the red mat and actually throughout our relationship our coaching relationship we always referred to anything to do with her experiences as the red mat which was you know it was quite an endearing and good way to connect in a lighter way um, and so I worked with her and got to know her as a person and what she really wanted was to really not talk about that anymore you know she wanted to heal from it and by talking about it it was just making her relive it and this is what the problem is is a lot of other therapeutic uh, tools that can work really well for managing and coping with different situations. A lot of those tools like counselling and CBT, they're storytelling tools. So when I worked with this uh, person, um, I got to know her and we worked on the key characteristics. So we stepped away from the story and just focused on the key characteristics, which was you know, she's finding it difficult to trust anybody. She she has this deep-rooted issue with her self-worth, her self-esteem's on the floor. She's got confidence issues. She's not going out because she's too scared to. She had to change her identity. She had to move area. She got two children. She was feeling isolated. And so we focused on those issues, not the problem, not what's already happened. We can't change the red map. But what we can do is we can work on those key characteristics, you know, the emotional overwhelm she's feeling, how she can reset her boundaries so it never happens again, how, you know, she can um, identify and process her emotions so she's not swallowing all this anger down. And all of this helps her to become more healthy. And we worked on this. And one day she came in and she said, you're not going to believe what I did at the weekend. I said, what was that? She said, I went to London with the children and I negotiated the tube. This was a person who couldn't look up from the floor or leave her house only if she had to take her children to school. You know, she rebuilt her relationships with her family. She um, put together this really good support group. Um, for herself she went back to um, well she went to university to study for an art degree she started an art business she's now living um, in a really great place with a new partner in a healthy relationship and you know that's a good story right that's an amazing story Louise and what a powerful story to talk about how important coaching is in people's lives my final question for you, as a coach working with 
women like this who have been in violent or coercive control relationships, when should you refer on to other professionals? Yeah, and that is very important because I work with people who are um, as an aftercare situation. OK, so I don't work with people who are in it because there are organisations and professionals um, who can really help with those practicalities. So if someone presents to you, they're actually in a domestic abuse situation, refer them on to the National Domestic Abuse Helpline 0808 There are other ways that you can uh, refer on. So if there's a safeguarding issue that comes up, um, you can refer on to um, any domestic abuse organisation uh, or you can phone social services. But obviously, you know, that's got to be with their permission. Confidentiality is key to build trust with clients. And so the confidentiality statement that I use is that if I feel that that person's at risk or there's any risk to harm for children, um, then that's when I would refer on for safeguarding purposes. The other thing, which is a key, key thing, is that somebody might come to you because they're seeking out help um, when they're about to leave a relationship. And this is a vital piece of information. When somebody is about to leave a relationship, they are in the most dangerous place in a domestic abuse, domestic violence situation. That is the most dangerous time. Most statistics say that that's when um, people who have been in an abusive situation are killed. And let's remember, there's two people a week who are killed. Um, at the hands of domestic abuse. So this is a huge issue um, and it's something that coaching can really help with, but only once that person's out of that situation. Thank you so much, Louise. It has been so insightful and so useful for us as coaches. If you'd like to find out more about working with Louise, then she can be contacted at empoweredrelationships.co.uk. We're confident that anyone who attains an international authority for professional coaching and mentoring accreditation will be among the very best that the profession has to offer. So if you're someone who's interested in having some coaching and mentoring and want to find an accredited coach, mentor or training provider, or if you're a professional who's interested in becoming accredited, then please go to our website, coach-accreditation.services. And finally, if there's a topic that you would like me to cover on future episodes of Both Sides of the Coin, then I would love to hear from you. My email, jenny.podcast at coach-accreditation.services. Bye for now.